Yeah, welcome back. My name is Annie Flom. I'm the communications manager for Income Movement, um, and I will be moderating our panel today, which is uh, growing implementation from the local to state level, an Oregon example. Um, so first off, I just want to give another thank you to our sponsors, the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, the Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Steady. Continue to shout them out because we would not be here if it weren't for their support. So thank you to them. Um, also, just a reminder, the session is being recorded live on Crowdcast. Um, so you can always you know, go back, watch it again if you feel like it. Um, and you can find those links on the big conference website. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to start out by saying um, I'm so excited that you all are on stage with us right now. You know, this all kind of homegrown Oregon organizations um, doing incredible work in the state. And yeah, Wu is right. <laughs> Wu is right. Um, and Income Movement, we have, you know, two uh, members of our team based in Portland. Um, and they've been doing, you know, work in the past few months, kind of getting folks together, building coalitions um, in the direct cash space um, and kind of economic justice organizations more broadly, um, just trying to get everybody in one room, you know, in community, kind of sharing ideas um, and, you know, moving the ball forward on the work that we're all doing. So this is, I think, the third event in the last couple months um, with that coalition work. So we're really excited to kind of keep, keep it moving and have you all here. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, so Mary Lee, who's right here, um, is with Multnomah Idea Lab. She is the director of the Multnomah Idea Lab um, at the Multnomah County Department of County Human Services. The MIL seeks to positively change community conditions resulting from poverty and racism by practicing equity and human-centered human collaborative design, seeking out critical thinking and research, and conducting applied research tests in the real world. So thank you for being here, Mary. Um, our second panelist is Matthew Ramuson from the Oregon Department of Human Services. Matt oversees the Youth Experiencing Homelessness Program with the Oregon Department of Human Services, and he's been working in the state government with child welfare and self-sufficiently self-sufficiency programs since 2009. So welcome, Matt. Um, Angela Huff from Point Source Youth is enthusiastic and passionate about building capacity within communities in order to systematically provide marginalized youth and families with the tools and resources needed to thrive. Um, she's worked with youth, families, and individuals experiencing homelessness for over 10 years, which is awesome. Um, and then we have Cameron Witten from Brown Hope. Um, at the age of 18, Cameron worked themselves out of youth homes, homelessness in Portland and has spent the past decade giving back to the same community that was here when they needed it most. Cameron has been a leader in several movements for social change, served as the executive director of Q Center, and is currently the CEO of racial justice nonprofit Brown Hope and co-founder of the Black Resilience Fund. Awesome. And then we have uh, two folks from the Oregon People's Rebate. First is Antonio Hisbert. Um, Antonio is a former scientist and union organizer whose passion for economic justice led him to organize the Oregon People's Rebate, a people-powered statewide ballot initiative campaign to leverage increased corporate tax justice to alleviate poverty in Oregon through universal yearly direct cash transfers. So welcome, Antonio. And uh, last but not least, we have Anthony Johnson, also from OPR. Um, Anthony is a formal, former criminal defense attorney um, he's been the chief petitioner for three Oregon statewide ballot measures to reform the state's criminal justice system, leading the passage of the legalization of marijuana and more. He's currently serving as the political director for the Oregon People's Rebate. So welcome all of you. That's a really stacked cast we have here. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to get right into some questions. Um, so first wanted to get a bit of background on direct cash and kind of guaranteed income work that you all have been doing here in Oregon. Um, so Mary, I wanted to start with you. Um, so Multnomah Idea Lab has been distributing a lot, a considerable amount of cash during COVID um, via kind of a co coalition of organizations that you work with. Um, and you also kicked off 
a direct cash slash guaranteed income pilot. So I'd love to have you tell us about those. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. It's very uh, wonderful to be with this group of amazing people and uh, a little bit distance from them because I uh, have a mobility challenge right now. Uh, and very uh, shout out to the folks who are watching us uh, remotely. Uh, my name is Mary Lee. I use she or my name. I am Chinese American and I work in the mill, which is the Multnomah Idea Lab. And we are located in the Department of County Human Services. So I identify also as a proud bureaucrat. And I would invite any of my other uh, bureaucrat colleagues here to also reclaim that. Um, the mill has been engaged in un what we call unconditional cash transfer planning, dreaming work for a very long time. And the money that has come as the result of the pandemic has been an incredible opportunity for us. Specifically, I can talk about a number of things. Uh, the department under which I work, which is the Department of County Human Services, has embraced this concept of unconditional cash transfer in a variety of ways. Uh, two years ago, we participated with the CARES Act funding, about $3 million that we worked with approximately 39 community-based organizations to try to move unconditional cash, right? So unconditional meaning there's no requirement. You don't have to do anything. You simply are able to access it because you have the need. It was focused uh, predominantly and almost exclusively in communities uh, that identified as black, indigenous, or people of color. That was a self-identification. Brown Hope was one of our partners in that. And uh, that pushed our organization quite a bit to think about unconditionality, right? Government is very easily able to give you money with conditions. If you do this, I will give you that. If you don't do this, you don't get that. Um, and pushing uh, our government systems to think about unconditionality is a really important piece of the work that needs to be done. This past year, we used uh, ARP, American Rescue Plan, uh, dollars to about the uh, amount of $4 million. We expanded uh, the reach in terms of our systems of care, working with both seniors and people with intellectual and development disabilities, in addition to our community-based organizations. And I'm really thrilled to tell you that next year in the budget just got passed for the county, we'll be at close to $5 million of unconditional cash transfer out of our department. Now, you know, that's a billion dollar, a multi-billion dollar county budget, and we're getting excited about five million, and we should be excited about it. And I also want us to understand scale and scope. Um, there are other uncondition uh, unconditional projects that are happening in other departments across the county. Uh, those are the ones that the mill is directly involved in. So important uh, things that we've learned over these last three, uh, two and soon to be three years is that um, we can increase the unconditionality of the aid and the assistance and the money that we are offering as a governmental entity. There are lots of people who want to tell you you can't, and that's not true. We have used TANF dollars unconditionally. We have used this pandemic money unconditionally, and we certainly can use general funds unconditionally. It is a choice. It is a perspective. It is a, a practice that government certainly can adopt. The second thing that we've been able to do over this amount of time is to increase the amounts. When we started, we were talking about payments of $250. We now don't do less than $500, and we're moving up towards $800 and $1,000 or multiple payments uh, for people, not yet a basic income, but multiple payments. The amount of money matters. The research shows that in families with children, an addition of $2,000 into an annual budget starts to produce all sorts of additional protective factors for the child and for the family. So increasing that amount to get to that level and above is really critical in terms of what the outcomes are. And we have also increased our breadth of uh, engagement with organizations. We had not had an engagement with Brown Hope or other organizations prior to this moment. And it's not easy to get money. I can't really tell you this, it's not easy to work with the government. To, to get this kind of resource. And um, we've increased our relationships, we've increased our scope. So those are some important learnings from that. The other piece that I think is exceptionally important to us is a project that we call the Multnomah Mothers Trust. And what the trust is, is a project where we are working with 100 African-American female-led households with children. And uh, these households are in relationship with two nonprofit organizations in the community, the Black Parent Initiative 
and uh, Women's First, which is a reentry uh, transitions program. And the members of our trust, right? We're not calling them clients. We don't call them community. Well, we would call them community. We don't call them consumers. They're members of the trust. The members of the trust are receiving a monthly income that is unconditional. And they are also being compensated for their participation in a variety of design processes. And uh, significantly, they are also uh, in control of their own data and of their own experience. So they, there's no case management. There's no, I'm gonna enter data for you. A family decides whether they're gonna enter data and we compensate them for it. So you enter your data in monthly in a platform that we use. You decide whether you're gonna answer that question or not answer that question. You decide one month you don't wanna do it. And we pay you for taking the time to share that information and control that information. So there's a lot that we have tried to take from our learning of the unconditional cash programs and put in here and Cameron I just I'm so happy to see you and I just I want to give you this shout out <laughs> so you have taught us so much in inside no it's true inside the county and and what and I want to give you a really concrete example of this when you um I think it was at least a year ago uh decided that you were going to use some of the unconditional cash that we had made available to Brown Hope to give black families a day of rest a weekend of pleasure a weekend of joy that went so deep into me. All of the contracts that we have now for the Mother's Trust have as a contract requirement that the organization support and uplift Black joy as an act of resistance. So it is written in the contract because you showed us that example of what that means and to, to show up with revolutionary love in a contract. And I'm going to tell you, my contract processing folks were like, you can't measure that. You can't put that in there. And it is in there. And it's in there because of the example of you and Brown Hope and of many other uh, organizations that we had the privilege to work with. So I want to say it's possible to work with the government. It's not always great. And, <laughs> I mean, and I work for the government. And it certainly makes a difference. Um, I'm going to check on time. We're good. OK. So uh, I just want to say a, a few more things about what we've learned, because because it's important to me. And I'm so glad I got to do that shout out for you. I'm turning brown right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on. I'm glad people got to hear it and see that. Um, this explicit focus on African-American families and African-American female-led households is super, super important. I think we get really confused about this general code language of diversity and equity and that doesn't mean I don't care about my own community. It doesn't mean that I don't care about other communities of color. And when we understand structurally the basis of this organ, the, the, country, the country's inception and organization and genocide and enslavement, and when we understand the, the, the systems that the government and our practices and investments continue to uplift and uphold, there is no other option but for us to focus within black families and within the black community. And that's... And that's a liberating thing to say. There are many people who say government can't say that. And that is another lie. It is not true. And so I just, I want to encourage those of you who are thinking about this to be really focused and really specific in how you are thinking about basic income. Uh, you know, we talk about basic income plus, right? The plus is the adjustment that should happen in a basic income project based on the actual wage and asset uh, gap between white households and people of color households, right? So if the white household is getting a dollar a month, the African-American household should be getting a dollar 95, the Latin household should be getting a dollar 90, whatever the actual gap is in wage and wealth and assets is what should be reflected in the basic income. So I wanna put that out to you. Um, and then I wanna say, <laughs> she's on fire. I think the last thing I want to say before I, uh, uh, before I end, which is um, cash from the government helps meet basic needs. It's not great, but it does. It helps meet rent. It helps meet food. It helps meet utility. When we can be unconditional and unconditionally intentionally understanding structures and systems, we gain so much more that we forget about, I think, when we think about the government and communities, right? We gain this access to self-determination. We gain an access to autonomy, and we gain an access to hope. And hope is a research-based component, research-based component of change. And when we don't pay attention to these sort of secondary or soft types of consequences or results,
from the method in which we offer assistance to communities, we lose out and I think we blunt the effectiveness. So that's my, uh, uh, yes, let's do more and more and more. Thank you. Wow, yeah, thank you so much. There's, I can't even begin to pull out, there's just so much that you put out there that you heard the snaps and the love <laughs> from all of that. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, and that's a great transition because my next question is for Cameron. So, um, I mean, Mary Lee went for me. Yeah. <laughs> we still want to hear from you. So, she knows more about our work yeah. than I do, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. So, I would love to just hear from you, just kind of similar question, you know, what Brown Hope is doing in terms of cash, cash distribution um, as a part of the pandemic and also kind of. Uh, the pilot that you're kicking off shortly and kind of what that's been like and yeah. Thank you, Annie. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Cameron Witten. My pronouns are he, him. All pronouns greatly appreciated and accepted. And uh, I'm the founder and CEO for Brown Hope, also the chief healing officer for Brown Hope. And Brown Hope is a healing justice organization here in Portland um, and truly is just a, a wild dream for healing. Uh, we know that all communities, but especially Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities are impacted by racism, not just on the systemic level, but it impacts our bodies, impacts our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. And so racial trauma is real, and we need interventions such as those that Brown Hope champions so that we have true racial justice. And the true racial justice comes with healing, that we're living our most vibrant and full lives, and yes, I want to see applause, and I want to see praise, and I want to see hope. Most importantly, we need hope that that true healing is possible. We have to make that tangible. And so for Brown Hope as an organization, uh, and you know, I think a lot of folks, we talk about healing. Uh, and what we've done, which is apparently so revolutionary, is, oh, healing isn't that complicated, people. <laughs> and so for us, the idea is that healing is, ex is accessible. Our ancestors have been doing this since time immemorial. For some reason, we like to junk things up and make things complicated. And the revolutionary idea is to go back to our roots and find the healing that is encoded within the wisdom of our bones. And so three big things that we do as an organization. Obviously, we're here. So one of our big things is economic empowerment. And the brilliant idea is that people know what they need to thrive. And we just need to make sure that the resources are distributed fairly and equitably so that every single person has the opportunity to thrive. We also do social capital, We're talking about community building. We just went through this global pandemic and I know I've been lonely, y'all. I ain't see any of y'all sliding into my DMs, okay? I need some attention. Uh, we know that social cohesion is a huge determinant of health and livability. And so building spaces, and they don't have to be complicated. We're talking about spaces that are safe, where you can be your authentic self. Uh, we do that, we strive for that every day, and that is a huge part of healing. We also do spiritual capital. We know that when we have alignment with our mind, our heart, our body, and our spirit, that we ourselves can be agents of healing in every waking moment. So we teach things like meditation, somatic healing practices, and Reiki, so that, yes, we ourselves are able to heal in face of any pain, any adversity. So those three things together really compose the magic of what Brown Hope is. And so uh, cash transfer has been a part of our organization since we were first founded in 2018. At this time, you know, we had no programs, no board. We definitely didn't have any money, but I knew that it didn't take much to make sure that folks got the recognition, representation, and support that they needed. And so the very first thing we did was an event that was called Reparations Happy Hour. I say that because, you know, we did get a little bit of, of hate and pushback back in the day, and it's so weird four years later, people are like, oh, wait, this was actually a great idea. Well, Reparations Happy Hour, the idea was we put on a monthly event for Black, Brown, Indigenous folks to come together to build community and heal from the impacts of racism. And as Mary Lee said earlier, this is work. When we talk about wanting to see Oregon especially as a place where black, brown, indigenous people to thrive, literally defying the history of Oregon statehood, we're talking about work. The work that I have to do to claim joy in a state that has tried time and time again to rob me of it, I'm putting in overtime, y'all, for my joy. And the fact that we can finally recognize that that is real work, and that is exactly the state that we want to live in. 
So with Reparations Happy Hour, we made sure that every single attendee got $10 for coming out of their way, whether that's taking away time from work, from family, from other healing activities, to build a, a space with us uh, once a month. Uh, but we've doubled down on that work since 2018. Uh, you know, COVID impacted our organization like many others, uh, but when George Floyd was murdered, it was really, it struck a chord in this community and realizing what we'd been saying since 2018, that we need healing. When we are in the moments of grief, of confusion, seeking answers, this is the perfect time to rally and come together and really make a tangible immediate action. And so uh, I remember uh, a couple of days after George Floyd was murdered, my phone was flooded. I was getting texts by all these white allies who just discovered racism existed and they were checking in on me. How are you doing? How can I help? And I was like trying to look for like medium articles. I was like, did we just discover racism? Is there like a, a secret article to check in on your black friends right now? And um, I never, I've been a Black Lives Matter activist since Black Lives Matter was a thing. And this was my first time ever like feeling this deluge where I wanted to turn my phone off. Like, apparently I wasn't that lonely, y'all. <laughs> but um, being an organizer and really having a heart in this community, I knew that this love and attention was a privilege. And I knew a lot of Black folks were not in my position to get that support. And so I said, yeah, y'all can help. Uh, here's my PayPal, here's my Venmo, here's my Cash App. And don't worry, I will get this funding to folks who need it. A month later, we had raised over a million dollars to the Black Resilience Fund. And we knew we needed to get that money out to as many Black people as possible. This was truly community-led for the community. And we knew every Black person needed to feel seen and represented by our organization. And so we knew that we couldn't give everyone everything they needed, but we knew what we wanted to do was give people real, tangible support. And so we decided to give $300 to as many Black Portlanders as possible, which at that time was over 3,000 folks. And uh, truly grateful for the way the community rallied. Uh, we continued that work for two whole years, which totaled with support from Multnomah County, Oregon Health Authority, many other foundations and agencies. And since 2020 of June, uh, Black Resilience Fund has raised over $2.6 million that's distributed to over 8,000 Black Portlanders in the four county region. Yeah. And it's been amazing just to see the stories of people who've come to us about how Black Resilience Fund helped them. And it was more than just the money. It was magical to hear folks say, for the first time ever, I came as myself. I didn't have to be interrogated. I wasn't questioned. I was really welcomed. And I was appreciated for being a part of this. And I was able to help other people, whether that was my friend or my family or my booty call. Yeah, <laughs> help them out too. <laughs> Uh, people who were just helping others. And that was the beauty of it. It wasn't about Black Resilience Fund being generous. It was this community being generous to itself. And so really seeing us turn from a place of fear and competition to collaboration and love. Um, I want to see more of that. And that's the beautiful thing about basic income. We're not fighting and questioning and judging and not trusting. We are actually showing that we are here because we care and that we're all headed toward the, the same goal. And so 2022 is coming up. We're dealing with a new year with a whole new slate of issues. And we know that Black Resilience Fund was created in the height of COVID. And our definition of resilience has to change as the dynamic in the society changes as well. And we know that the road to recovery from COVID-19 is going to take many years. That's what we're here for. Black Resilience Fund was here to make a lasting impact. And so we made a decision to transform the fund this year into a three-year basic income model. And the idea is that we are going to be giving up to $2,000 a month to hopefully 50 Black families in our first cohort. And uh, this is for uh, folks in Multnomah County. And again, no strings attached. But we also decided that this is a village building model. And so we do have monthly social gatherings for our participants to be a part of. And the dream is not only do you leave this three-year program with financial stability and money in your pocket, but you're also leaving with best friends. And so uh, we are very, very excited to see this revolutionary dream come to Portland. Uh, we know that basic income works and we want to see not just Multnomah County, but statewide us really seeing 
the second we take that initiative that we can see transformative change. And so we're also just gonna be spending a lot of time doing our impact work, uh, doing our focus groups, doing our, our data work, because we do believe that this is the work that's gonna change the game in, in Portland and beyond. And I'll just stop there because yeah. you know, <laughs> me and her, we could take this whole yeah. <laughs> session. I know, I wanna thank you so much. We got a big panel, so I just wanna make sure everyone gets a chance. Um, but yeah, I, I love, what you were saying and just about the way um you know brown hope is kind of reframing what people deserve i mean i think that's why we all love you know direct cash and basic income it's it's not only you know helping people have a floor to stand on in just kind of a mo most basic way like people should deserve to be alive and not live in poverty but it's also this radical reframing of what do you deserve you know do you deserve space for joy and space for community and and yes we say yes obviously and you know the space to heal um and i think that's so beautiful to to center those things in your work along with the cash so that's awesome um yeah um okay so i want to now pivot over to matt and angela um so the oregon department of human services and point source youth have teamed up um to launch a pilot so i would love to hear kind of the origin story of that the collaboration um yeah and just take it away can you, can you hear me is it, com is it coming out okay <laughs> let me redo this <laughs> is that okay i'm just gonna hold it it'd be kind of awkward but uh so my name is matt rasmussen i use he him pronouns i, I like was said, I, I work for the Department of Human Services. Uh, I'm a state government employee. It's really weird to have multiple state or multiple government people talking about basic income at the same time, um, but kind of an exciting venture for me. Um, so just just a little bit, just a little bit of background on uh, my program in general and how it led to this uh, pilot that we're embarking on. So um, my program, the Youth Experiencing Homelessness Program, has been in state government since 2012. Um, it was a half-time position for the first six, seven years. Um, it eventually went full-time position in 2019. The budget has increased since that time, but we're still operating currently under on a $3 million per biennium budget for all youth-specific services through state government. Um, so it's a little small, all things considered. Um, so what we do with those, um, well, what I do with those grants, um, uh, most of the money goes out in grants to providers that provide job development or mentoring services for young people, um, provide street outreach, drop-in services, and also shelter. And through the conversations, I mean, this is not really rocket science, but one of the challenges has been um, housing specifically for young people. Um, a lot of young people end up getting stuck in a, a continually revolving system, whether that's you know through a state-funded shelter or a federally funded shelter, is that young people are coming in and then they reach a certain threshold of how long they can stay there and then they have to leave and then they have to come back in again. And really kind of the discussion about, well, how do you get young people out of that cycle? How do, how do you do that? And really the, the answer is there needs to be youth specific housing. Like there just needs to be. And not a lot of people think youth specific housing or that money is going towards youth and housing. But when you kind of break it down, oftentimes you're looking at families with young children, which is definitely necessary and viable to support. But at the same time, it looks a little different when you're talking about a 17, 18, 19 year old that is spending for themselves because their family situation is non-existent or is not great. And so how are you making sure that you're, I don't want to use prioritizing necessarily, but looking at young people's housing uh, different from other potential um, opportunities that are out there. And so that led us has led us over the last few years on a variety of housing initiatives, one of which being um, host homes, which is a longer term, potentially longer term housing initiatives that are out of a shelter base, but kind of more into a, a, a situation where young people um, can select who they would like to live with, um, being able to kind of be supported in that way. Um, and also um, through that venture, uh, we connected with Point Source Youth, who um, is kind of a leader in both host homes and in direct cash transfers, and really kind of got the wheels rolling a little bit more on that. Um, so our pilot um, is in motion, and it's right at the point where we're getting really close to um, paying young people. But in, in a really general sense, we are working um, with 80 young people across the state 
um, spread out between 60 young people in the Portland area and 20 young people in Deschutes County in Central Oregon, where we will be uh, working with three community-based organizations um, that are going to be there as support for the young people. Um, young people don't, it, it's unconditional funding. Young people don't have to engage with community-based organizations if they don't want to, but we've also found out through youth advisors that we've hired that it would be really great to potentially have some insight into financial management now that we actually have money for the first time, um, you know, somebody to, to call when things get tough. So um, we're working with uh, J Bar J Youth Services in Deschutes County, um, Ant Farm, which is a small uh, program, relatively new, but they're based out of Sandy, um, and also uh, Native American Youth Association here in Portland. Um, so there'll be 60 young people in Portland, 20 in Deschutes County. Um, Portland young people will be receiving $1,000 a month. Um, young people in Deschutes County will be receiving $750 a month. Um, both of those are based off of about 50% of fair market rent. Um, and they'll also be able to take a one-time $3,000 payment that can assist with certain expenses that can come up, such as moving expenses, you know, maybe they need to pay down some bills or, or need a car for work or whatever. Um, so we are, again, we're right at that part of being able to do that. Um, and it's just really an exciting prospect of being able to put youth uh, in the driver's seat. Um, I used to work in child welfare and we are, and child welfare services, while great and necessary, I, I worked in a teen unit and it was very much a transactional relationship a lot of the times that a young person needs to attend a certain number of classes or meet with their caseworker a certain number of times in order to maybe be able to receive certain funding opportunities and really in my time there in child welfare, um, where I saw the success was when we all took a step back and was like, what do you want? Instead of us saying, you're going to live here, you need to do this, like, just, that's not working. So tell us what you want. And seeing some really positive outcomes kind of led to this, like, well, what if we did this on a more, uh, you know, appropriate housing-based model um, for young people who, who, you know, are ready for that sort of, um, you know, ability to be a part and a, and a, and make decisions for themselves as opposed to us as state government making the decisions that we think that they need. So anyways, uh, so that, that's the pilot itself. I know Point Source Youth um, is helping us with that and Angela is helping us with that. Um, and I'll maybe let her just talk about Point Source Youth in general and the work that they've seen in this sphere uh, across the country. Thanks, Matt. And I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay? All right. Um, yeah, so I am uh, an associate director, I'm sorry, an associate um, at Point Source Youth over our programs team, and I particularly work with direct cash transfers as well as rapid rehousing. So I come from a rapid rehousing background um, where I did that for roughly 10 years. Um, and so direct cash transfer is fairly new for me, but um, I'm based in Georgia and we started a direct cash transfer on a small scale there and so now i get to go to communities and learn about what they're doing and kind of advise a little bit about direct cash transfers so i am super excited to be here today um it's important to me to be here and i'll tell you how important it was uh today is my 15th anniversary oh. <laughs> so um but it was important enough for me to come because I, I'm a huge advocate for direct cash transfers, particularly for our young people. And so one thing that Matt has kind of given you an overview of what the pilot looks like. Um, one thing that I wanted to just kind of highlight is the fact that we have youth consultants that are there every step of the process. So they are there, and I mean, from helping with the organizations, helping every phone call that we have, every meeting that we have, they're a part of the hiring process for the staff. They are part of every decision that's made, the script that is being used, the orientation, everything that we're doing, we are um, utilizing the youth and paying them for their wisdom and their experience. And I'm not talking about minimum wage, I'm talking about a consultant's fee a full consultant's fee over $100 each hour for their advice and for their wisdom that they're bringing to the table. And so that's something that I always like to highlight because I find that that's very unique. I find that there's a lot of organizations that when they um, ask you into the room, they expect them to just come for a gift card or they expect them to come just because you should. Um, but we really are using their expertise. So I love the fact that we're able to have them um, in the room on the calls and actually leading us in this entire effort. And so one thing about the project as well, outside of just the money is the support of services that go along with it as well. 
and nothing is mandated, but we do offer, as Matt has said, financial empowerment, which is major. Um, housing navigation, which is a huge task in itself. And so being able to navigate um, fair market rent and increasing rent. And um, what if I have an animal? What if I have this situation? Um, how do I advocate for finding housing that has air conditioning, which is completely unique to uh, Portland for me? I'm from Georgia. And so like, I expect everybody to have air conditioning. <laughs> So a young person actually brought that up in one of the meetings and said, you know, we also need to be intentional about helping them to look at the amenities that are offered, like air conditioning. I'm like, what do you mean, you know? <laughs> so, um, but being able to have those conversations as well as just overall case management as well. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention is that the eligibility is open. I mean, that there, there's nothing to be eligible, be a young person that's in need, which I love. But we did have to do some work in order to um, see how do we get down to those 80 slots that were mentioned. And one of the things that the community has come together to say they wanted to look at is who is falling through the gaps right now. And so there is an emphasis on LGBTQ, um, Two-Spirit, BIPOC, um, Black Indigenous People of Color, um, youth that don't have documentation, um, all ranging from 18 to 24 years old. And so those are the ones that will um, get preference, if you will. I don't like the term priority either, but it's like, I can't think of a better word for it right now. Um, but those are the ones that are getting prioritized for this assistance. And the program is for a year right now, but we're working on two years over here so that we can get <laughs> two years. Um, and being able to really just establish, um, be able to establish financial stability um, and being able to know how to use the funds. And so that's what we're working on right now. And I'm excited about the progress. We have had a couple of hiccups here and there, but we've been able to work through everything. And my, this is my first time in Portland and my first time in Oregon as a whole. And one of the things that um, I wanted to do while I was here was to see the communities. And so I got up this morning about three o'clock this morning, I drove to Bend and spent the morning in Bend to see what was going on over there. And I can tell you, like, each community is so unique and there's so many unique needs. And so I, I think that what I love about direct cash transfer is it allows each individual young person to do what they need to do, um, regardless of what community you're in, regardless of what situation you're in, regardless of what you look like, regardless of how you identify, you're able to take the funds and do what you need to do with that. So, yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's absolutely incredible the way, you know, both of your organizations are emphasizing young people know what they need just the same as adults do. You know, absolutely. there shouldn't be this kind of patronizing, oh, you know, we're the adults, you're the children. We, we, you know, get to decide for you. I think it's incredible that that's being really emphasized in your work. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, we are running a little bit short on time, so I just want to make sure I can get to you two, and then I want to save a little bit of time for questions, if we have questions coming through. Um, so would love to hear from um, Anthony and Antonio about the work you're doing in Oregon with your ballot measure coming up for 2024. So if you could tell us a little bit about your work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I want to express uh, gratitude for all the heroes in the space and out there. Uh, you're an inspiration, and uh, thank you for doing that great work. So, thank you. Uh, my name is Antonio Gisbert. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I think that my contribution in this space is the Oregon People's Rebate, which is a statewide ballot initiative that I had the privilege uh, to sort of uh, start a few years back, done in rural Oregon. And my contribution really was uh, pretty simple. I convened a group of uh, community members, people who I admire, my friends, uh, to meet uh, and discuss, uh, imagine a better, a more just society. And that process took about eight months of uh, consensus building, consensus driven conversation decision making. And the end product of that was four pages of legislation that we are, that we call the Oregon People's Rebate that we are now trying to qualify for the November 2024 general election here in Oregon. And uh, what the legislation does, it basically does two things and it's really pretty straightforward. One of the things that we had identified 
was that giant corporations like Comcast are not really paying their fair sharing taxes at all in Oregon. In fact, the minimum corporate tax rate for these giant corporations in Oregon is less than one eighth of 1%. Wow. Right, that's kind of shocking because we all as human beings pay between five and 10% taxes in Oregon. So we thought, gee, um, what happens if we increase that minimum corporate tax rate to 3%? That, that seems like a good place to start. And in fact, that generates about $3 billion of new revenue every year. Okay. So then the second thing that we innovated is what to do with these $3 billion, <laughs> <laughs> which you can probably imagine that uh, we decided to, uh, to rebate that money to every Oregonian. <clears throat> Thank you. So a couple of things about it that is super important is that uh, the only requirement is to actually be an Oregonian, and we define that as somebody who spends 200 days in the state, at least 200 days in the state of Oregon. So that means that, uh, and we were explicit in including as recipients, as eligible recipients of the rebate, uh, everybody regardless of age, income, or status. Uh, so. Kids and dependents are also eligible for the rebate. So a family of four, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say something. There's about 4 million Oregonians. And if you divide 3 billion into 4 million, you get about 750 bucks, which is why you're gonna hear me reference $750 all the time. Importantly, that is just an approximation and the actual number is gonna sort of float up and down a bit. But anyway, so what happens when you give every Oregonian about 750 bucks a year? turns out that you reduce overall poverty by about 15%, and you reduce childhood poverty by about 26%, right? That, that's super amazing effect sizes, right? A family of four, right, would get four rebates or about $3,000. That's a gigantic deal for families. Um, and, and importantly, uh, and this is, and, and um, uh, so, so uh, minors and dependents are eligible as well, but so are um, our unhoused neighbors, uh, incarcerated folks, and undocumented folks. Mm -hmm. And it's super, super important that we be explicit when we do this work in making sure that we like hard, like that we actually write in our moral intentions in this law. And so. Uh, that process was super interesting and like kind of beautiful to figure out how it is that we can provide like a rebate to really to everyone, so we can all be equally deserving of the um, of, of of the dignity that we all internally like possess and own. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, the fact that we are so universal. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. But uh, basically, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're just trying to make the world a better place this way. Yeah. And I can uh, thank you. Thank Antonio. you. <laughs> and uh, Anthony Johnson, I can uh, piggyback a little bit. Antonio has stated uh, my work has been in criminal justice reform. And my work in that realm started as a racial justice issue. Seeing my black friends in college treated more harshly for drug offenses like for cannabis and learning more about the drug war and seeing how that impacted communities of color. And so working with Antonio to bring some economic justice to our economic system has been a true honor. And it's a true honor to be with people working in this space, learning from people in this space. And what you know, Antonio has touched upon, we don't have oil here in Oregon like Alaska does with their Alaska dividend fund, but we do have corporations like Comcast that are making record-breaking profits while working class people, everyday people are getting squeezed more and more and having a harder and harder to make ends meet. So let's have them start to pay their fair share, spread that money around to everybody, and let's uplift everyone across uh, the state. That money goes right back into our local communities. And so you can use that money to support your local coffee shops, your local businesses, your food carts. If you don't need the money yourself, donate it to Brown Hope, right? And so we can, uh, uh, you know, we can utilize those revenues to uplift everyone. And I think we can learn a lot from uh, the drug policy reform movement and how local pilot projects, 
ballot measures can build success upon success. So before Washington, California, Colorado, Oregon, you know, legalized cannabis for adults, Seattle passed a low, law enforcement priority measure. San Francisco passes a measure. Denver passes a measure. And people learn that these measures are successes. The sky doesn't fall and we get to keep people out of prison. We get to, you know, uplift everyone. And that's why these pilot projects are so important. And getting the word out is so important because you run into people who think when they hear about universal basic income and concepts like that, it seems like it's this radical idea that in some ways is ahead of its time. I'm guilty of that as well. When I first learned about universal basic income, I was like, that doesn't seem like it can work. But then the more you learn about it and you learn about pilot projects in Stockton and New York and what uh, Cameron's doing and other people are doing across the country, you see that works. We've seen it nationwide uh, during the, uh, with the COVID stimulus payments and the uh, child tax credit. You get to uplift everybody, keep kids out of poverty, and of all the things the government spends money on, having fewer hungry kids seems like a good thing to, to spend our money on. So uh, let's just keep doing this work and we can build upon our success. And it's really just an honor to be here with everybody in this space. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, and after after hearing from all of you, I just think it's you know just so moving. Um, I live in Texas, so it's a bit of a different uh, environment there. Um, but it's just absolutely incredible to hear in how many different ways direct cash is being used in this state, how many millions of dollars are being given back to folks, and, you know, through different lenses, through youth homelessness, through, you know, with kind of, you know, thinking about criminal justice reform and all of that, I just think it's, and it doesn't always go by the name of guaranteed income too, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, stimulus payments, child tax credit, um, even mutual aid, you know, people, there's a lot of different terms for it. Um, but the bottom line is that direct cash works and it works on a lot of different levels. So it's, it's just incredible to see all of the work that you're doing to kind of get the word out. <laughs> Sky doesn't fall. It, it works. Um, amazing. So I just wanted to open it up to audience questions. We have a bit of time left. Um, so also people in the audience, feel free to come up to the mic, but we have some, um, questions from the people at home as well. So we can have those. I will start with um, something a little basic here from Madeline um, on our virtual platform. She asks about unconditional and universal. She says here, unconditional is the same as universal. So people who don't need a UBI get it unconditionally. Anyone want to take a <laughs> stab at helping, helping the audience understand that difference? Well, I would say that like universal means it goes to everybody. It's universal for everyone. Mm -hmm. And unconditional means it means there's no strings attached. Mm -hmm. So you could have universal basic income, but in, be conditioned on various things. And there, there are some pilot programs that make people take a, or that have been proposed that make you take a financial class, or you have to, you know, stay out of trouble, or you have to do various things, take a parenting class. There's conditions, there's strings attached to that, that, uh, that revenue. Unconditional mean you get it no matter what, and, you know, so it's treated like a public good, like everybody can go to the public library. Everybody gets to utilize this and it's unconditionally and it's no, no strings attached to it. And if I may add to that, it's super important that we be very careful and be very, um, uh, just, just careful when we use this, this label. So for example, in, in the US we, we technically have, or, or you will hear talk about, you'll hear the, the idea of universal suffrage, as in like that everybody can vote but in fact, not everybody can vote. That's right. And so, I, please, I implore you mm -hmm. to define your terms. Yeah. <laughs> and if you really want to make something universal and unconditional, yeah. you got to say so. Like, be very explicit about it. Antonio, I would just uh, follow on to and say, I avoid using the term universal attached to the discussion of basic income for some of the reasons that have been said. I think it's, it's not a healthy framework for our work to be uh, organized under the unconditional, thank you, Anthony, for that uh, great, uh, the unconditionality speaks to the uses and the self-determination of it. Um, you know, it's that crazy poster of the kids at the ball field and there's the fence. I abhor that picture, right? And so people think, well, if we just give some of the kids boxes and, you know, <laughs> fill in the hole that the other kids, right? Like, tear down the fence. Just get rid of the fence. Do things that are much more um, 
targeted. And uh, John Powell's work that many people are familiar with is targeted universalism. I don't talk about universal basic income. We talk about basic income and this concept of basic income plus that is titrated to the real incomes of real people, particularly black, indigenous, and people of color. If I could just jump in real quick to talk about that picture. I don't know if you've seen the latest one. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Where now they show the people actually participating. And that's something I thought was just powerful because you're not just observing, but now you're actively participating. And that's what we really want to get towards. And that's really um, why I think I advocate so much for you to be involved in every part of what we're yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't want to build it for you. We want to include you. We want you to make the decisions and we're just along to help. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. I, the picture that you talk about, I know exactly what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. I've <laughs> seen like probably about five different variations of mm -hmm. it, but I think I that know. one was the most powerful one to be. Have to look that up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, Joshua Miller, uh, student at the University of Chicago with the UBI Center. Um, I'll just sign up on the on the picture um, of the uh, baseball analogy. Eventually, there's no more home runs, or uh, it doesn't, or no more nine players on each team. I feel like we got to find a new sport, <laughs> maybe marathons. Um, but anyway, my question is: uh, so a lot of the programs you're talking about are you know these conditional. Um, transfers for, you know, for, say, impoverished youth or uh, for certain, you know, demographics. Uh, these are kind of localized, obviously, you know, this point of session. So my question is, how do you take these community-based programs that focus specifically on certain demographics or on, you know, you know, community building exercises, community building as a way to fund or manage the program and, you know, look into scaling them up? Uh, because obviously the hope is to not just have this in a certain city, you know, community or state, but the help you know achieve you know you know maybe in oregon a gross receipts tax to fund the you know rebate my work but like across the united states how do we get you know at youth you know sorry at risk youth across the united states to make sure they have housing or cash transfers or things like that how do we scale up these programs and make them you know manageable on that level yeah i can talk a little bit about that just in a really simple uh component is we realize that even with the money that um, was graciously actually given to us from um, Housing and Community Services, another state agency, um, they are very invested in how this can look. And I think ultimately, you know, as a this social service agency component, um, oftentimes we're focused on that as on the services. And so having another state agency understanding that direct cash transfers has a housing component to it or or should have a housing component to it for young people uh, i think is imperative to like growing it beyond like a localized border or a city border that being said also within that um we're kind of operating that while we want to use direct cash transfers as housing um that as they again the the service delivery agency um that there's that there can be uh, benefits outside of just housing for this, really trying to focus on showcasing like what a young person's uh, whole physical self, mental health self looks like when they have access to cash, when they have to not worry about, um, you know, where their next meal or how they're going to pay rent or where they're going to stay or how many days they have left in shelter before they have to leave or, hey, can I go out to dinner with my friends and not have to like bum money off somebody like those sorts of things we're also wanting to showcase that i think can get to a more holistic approach to this of uh direct cash transfers yes is housing but is also so much more and can be so much more than that on a very molecular level too uh, i think maybe more specifically answering your question what we are doing with the assistance of point source youth is creating a uh, direct cash transfer handbook um, that can be utilized by local communities to kind of say this is what direct cash transfers in very general terms looks like this is what needs to be available this is who needs to be involved young people as angela has being said uh, has been saying so i think that there's that piece that we're wanting to establish as well that right now even though we do have a you know a, a large ask a relatively large ask for uh, a policy change uh, in this next session to increase funding for direct cash transfers that's not gonna be enough to uh, meet every young person's needs. So being able to also at the same time have a document, uh, a handbook, if you will, to give to communities to say, 
you want to do this, here are the steps to doing that, and here's what you need to be aware of. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of what we're wanting to do in, in expanding it beyond just the three counties that we have. And I think just overall, just talking about it, educating others about it. Um, I think there's a lot of stigma around giving cash to the poor, if you will, um, and those that are in need, which is crazy <laughs> to be. It, it's just completely insane. And even with youth, there's a lot of adultism where they believe that young people don't know what to do. They don't know how to help themselves. They don't know what they need. We need to do it for them, which is absolutely bananas. Um, and so I think that, and I lost my train of thought just now too, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that educating the public overall is something that needs to take place. And so um, that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is that Point Source Youth has done several years of research with Chapin Hall as well. And so not only just educating, but also connecting with other communities. We have a project we're working on in New York, in Boston, and other places to see what they're doing and what can we then look at and take from there and learn from and then be able to tweak it for our community here. And so being able to have those conversations, not just locally, but like across the spectrum. Um, I heard you say across the US, how do we build it? And so really just learning from each other and sharing the information and being able to pass a handbook on when needed, you know, being able to say, Here, here's what we did. This is how we started. This is how we got the state uh, to get funds, you know, and being able to have open conversations. Yeah, to piggyback on that, like you said, it's educating. It's person by person, city by city, county by county, state by state. And then all of a sudden you've got an allies in Congress you're proposing legislation that you never thought uh, was gonna, you were gonna see in your lifetime even. Or, and so you just gotta keep that education going. Conferences like this are a big, uh, big part of that, sharing information all across uh, the, the nation and even globe. And, and doing that work, whether you're working in the government, whether you're a director, whether you're an advocate or a student, spreading that word and showcasing our success. And that way we just build that city by city, state by state, and eventually we're shaking the halls of Congress. Amen. <laughs> um, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Would you like to ask another? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the presentations, Max Gennis from the UBI Center and Policy Engine. And I want to just uh, get your sense of the idea of a universal child allowance as a way to scale um, programs, sort of a UBI for kids. And given the context that, as you've seen, a lot of these ass existing assistance programs tend to target families with children. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of appetite for it. Um, and it can be scaled. I mean, I think you know the UBI overall as Oregon's pursuing is really interesting as well. Um, I would also be remiss not to mention that my friend Nate Golden is actually running a nonprofit called the Maryland Child, Child Alliance, which is advocating for a universal child benefit in Maryland. Um, so just wanted to get your thoughts on the political tractability and sort of the promise of an idea like that. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, for us, right, doing a, a statewide ballot initiative, there's basically two steps. Number one, we have to collect about 135,000 signatures, which is a relatively small problem. Uh, we sort of it's not that easy, but it's 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 a, it's a manageable thing. Uh, then the second step is that about that 50% plus one of Oregon voters need to vote for this thing. So that's that comes out to about 1.1 million votes in Oregon. And so th there are practical considerations when you're designing something that like to be voted on to make sure that enough people think that it is a good idea. And and so. Uh, that definitely colored some of the choices that we made because it's in front of our mind. And, and, uh, and it's, I mean, I, I'm all for like, putting cash in kids' hands. That seems like a great idea. Uh, and, and how to make that happen is, it, there's many ways of doing that. Uh, but using a political process, uh, it, it has its pros and cons. I also think it's a, it's a brilliant question to talk about. I appreciate you for bringing that up. And I also think a lot about what, you know, Mary Lee mentioned earlier about targeted universalism. And, you know, we can go all day looking at all these demographics and we know that 
we need basic income in this country. And so I think it's important for us to look at it from multiple angles, basic income for women, basic income for black, brown, indigenous folks, basic income for queer and trans people. And so I think for me overall, it is how do we start shifting narratives around policy in general to be looking at the strengths of basic income. So for me, it's not so much, how do we get this one idea you know, pass, but really like, how are we starting to really shift public policy to realize the more that we try to complicate any type of economic empowerment system, we are cre creating overhead and then we're spending so much money on uh, lobbyists and political discourse for bills that will never get passed in the first place. And so I, I definitely believe more and more, let's be looking at uh, whether these are already predetermined funds with statewide or federal social service programs. How do we see how to shift those programs from being what they currently are into basic income. So overall, I think it's a great idea and either you know passing new legislation or looking at uh, other sources of funding and transforming them in that direction. Just uh, add uh, a couple more thoughts uh, uh, strategy wise. Uh, yes, Cameron, this, I wanna invite us to stop using this term universality. It's like when we talk about the universal, the median, the average, Who's average? Who's median? Who's universality? It does not include many of us who are on this stage, right? So we've got to in, invite ourselves to think better about this language and to, and to figure it out. I also think there are two places that we've seen uh, our elected officials move on, which is changing the narrative about who is in poverty and why they're in poverty, and who is the benefit of government welfare, which are not people living on a low income, it's businesses, right? And then also really discussing and being clear about the role of government in these kinds of arenas and in these kinds of, of sector discussions, right? Uh, there's this, uh, I think, myth mythology that nothing that government does is good and government should keep its hands out of the way of business and free market. And now I'm going way woo capitalism, right? Let me go, <laughs> let me go there. It's just not true. Government has put its fingers and its, and its hands into all of that for the benefit that you that we that we all see. So being overt about that, being explicit about that, and that's not a short-term strategy. Having those discussions, who's in poverty, who's benefiting from government assistance and the role of government in in creating these structures has been effective for us with our local board of county commissioners in getting them to understand these projects and really also at the state legislature getting legislatures uh, to understand uh, those projects. So those would be some advice I would offer you as, as you think about how to move move your, your uh, work forward. Thanks. Sorry, I know I shouldn't ask a follow-up, but I'm just really curious, the uh, universality issue, um, could you expand on that? It seems like universal means if you're a human, you get it, and like that's, I think, what a number of folks in the room mean by UBI. Is that so if it's being perceived differently elsewhere. I'm well, there's curious. the reality of the lived experience of black, indigenous, and people of color from the inception of this, of this country, right? So founded in genocide and enslavement, completely organized and invested and created government structures, practices, and policies that reinforce and uphold and perpetuate uh, those, uh, those practices. And so when we say universal, there's an, it, you know, we can go way meta and say, yes, we're all human beings who, you know, need sleep and to eat and all of those kinds of things. And the very next down, we're all living in a structure. We're all living in a framework. We're all living in a reality that is not universal. It is not equitable. And it is incredibly racially unjust, right? So when we, when we use terms like universality and uh, some of these other terms that, you know, the median, the average, there's an assumption that who we're talking about is largely white folks. And the medianness is a white people's medianness that leaves out families and communities of color, that the universality of this is uh, a white people's universality, not a universality for people and communities of color. And that's the discussion I think we have to have to disrupt this. Uh, Cameron, I think you said earlier, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, many people who never understood or saw racism in this country, if you weren't a person of color, had the opportunity to be woken up a little bit and see it, and people were shocked, right? That is the same dynamic that I think we have to do with our movements, which is to wake ourselves up a little bit and say, I might not say, you know, I, I talked earlier about I've injured my knee. I didn't see the challenges that people who are 
permanently with mobility issues, walking and trying to get here. I, I see now, right? It's the same thing with white supremacy culture. It's the same thing with white national. It's all of those things that are structurally based. And so that's my response to the universality. Um, it's not the universe. We don't have a universal experience of poverty and of white supremacy culture and of racism. And so we can't have a universal response. And I'd love to add on that as well, because I'm not opposed to, you know, yes, primarily I, I, as a person, am not opposed to universal programs, but I believe there are nuances, as Mary Lee mentioned. And one of the challenges is that universality is simply tied to equality. And as Mary Lee said, we don't have equal experiences. And can we really say a universal <clears throat> policy is the most just policy? And uh, from my perspective, most universal programs are uh, 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 approached and introduced out of uh, uh, political convenience, because if we say it's universal, well, this country is based off of principles of freedom, equality, and it's something that we know that we can get folks who might be opposed to something that is more targeted and just to actually like it because they might get something out of it. Um, I think for a justice-focused organization, we are really trying to do what is right, not just what's convenient. And so I believe that universal programs are a step to more just programs in the long term. And the question really is looking concretely, is that universal program the best avenue? Because there might be better avenues than just making it apply to everyone. It does depend on location and geography and time of day and what's the current events. Uh, so I think it is an important conversation to start shifting the broader narrative around how we do economic empowerment work, but let's not say universal basic income is the panacea. It is a step towards long-term justice. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we're just about out of time, um, but if anyone has any closing thoughts they wanted to share? Question? Oh yeah. If, do we have time or no? Yeah, let's, yes. We'll right. get you in there. I'll be yeah. quick. Thanks. This is a fascinating discussion. My name is Jamie Seifer. I'm a concerned citizen and I live in Leadville, Colorado. We are a small rural mountain town. And I am pleased to say that about a month into COVID, our local nonprofits kind of put their heads together, created the Unmet Needs Committee. And to date, we have paid out $700,000 and have had no people evicted, which is cool. But uh, we still have about half of our ARP funding. We have kind of like a medium involved board of county commissioners and i'm curious to know with the little success of this program what is the sexiest pitch we can make to our electeds to get them to spend more money into an existing infrastructure to keep this going it's a great question <laughs> it's one time only so you shouldn't build infrastructure on it it's for it those purposes are, are perfect for it it, they're not setting new precedents because there's local governments all around the country who are already doing it, so they're not taking a, a risk, uh, you know, an enormous risk by doing it. Not, they're not setting precedents. And it's incredibly, it polls incredibly well with the community uh, once, uh, right? The job of the elected official is to get reelected. So it polls incredibly well when you talk to people without, uh, you know, Republican, Democrat, or whatever labels on it. Do you think families who are working hard and struggling? should get help so that they don't get evicted? Everyone says yes. Those are my three. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much, especially Angela, who's being here on her anniversary. Um, yeah, incredible. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's really inspiring to hear about your work here in Oregon. Um, so yeah, give them a round of applause.